So I, I hear a, a clear line of debarkation between uh, R and B, disco, you know, Dana Summer, dance music, club scene, and then there's Run DMC entered the scene. You know, um, you know, the message came on board that summer. You couldn't escape it. It was on the radio. You know, it was that's all you heard. So there's a clear debarkation of, you know, this is like my parents' music. Right, and now this is this is meant for me to consume. You know, this is something I'm going to embrace. Did you guys get that? Get that same type of like, yeah, this is this is the cutoff. I'm gonna I'm gonna right. now change the station to one for my parents are listening to to what I'm listening to. Is there a clear line? I mean, for some of you, it's your background music of your life, right? Growing up, because your parents had that that debarkation. To a certain extent, because then you gotta it, it evolved, and then you had gangster rap, and then it was right. like, okay, no, what are you listening to? Right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, do you feel early on there was um, that that you perceived a conscious message of this is a reflection of my life, and then it became something else? That's exactly what I was about to say. Because honestly, for me, hip hop was okay. It was music like Run DMC was a cool music, mm -hmm. but when for me, hip hop is a lifestyle, a culture. Mm -hmm. It was to the point of where. It became like, okay, it's, it's more than music, it's the clothes, it's the haircuts, it's mm -hmm. the way you talk, it's going home and watching videos, and, and Def Comedy Jam, I remember, I'm just sitting here looking at Zayna, and I remember that she had, like, I, you know, Michael Jordan wore this Mal Malcolm X hat, yeah. and everybody was like, man, where you get that, you know, the whole, you know, people were like, man, that's cool with Michael Jordan, it was some other, other athletes wearing it. And the only place you can get Michael, I mean Malcolm X apparel is from Spectacle. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. the thing, and, and you know that was hip hop. So so hip hop was going, taking the bus, going down to Spectacles. Yeah. And it was like, fine. Yeah, it's like, hey, oh, I got to Malcolm X. Yeah, you know, I was, was too like, young. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but, but I mean, she, I mean, she was on it because I remember I was in high school and I tried to buy a shirt. She like, how old are you? I'm like, I'm 17, you can't buy this shirt. You walk in, your eyes open, if you hadn't been there before, and you was all about hip hop. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Even, so even the consumer aspect of it was a consciousness raising experience. Oh. You see, the thing is, you had, you had different aspects of hip hop, especially okay. in Detroit. You got the trap, quote unquote, hip hop, dope yeah. boy. Then you got the backpackers, incense and oils, quote unquote, right. hip hop. And that's the category that I fall into. Right. And she catered to that right. all the right. way. Right. Like, to this day, like, I salute for that. Cause like, if I, I wanted to be that dude in school that looked like Tribe Called Quest, that's where <laughs> yeah. I wanted to get that out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, so from a female point of view, how does that relate to, to you and how you entered into hip hop and the consumerism and, and how products were marketed to you. The products were always marketed to the men in hip hop. So when it came to the feminine aspect of being a woman in hip hop, you just kind of had to like muscle your way in. You had to actually establish yourself. So, you know, there was a, a way for you to be a woman and be an MC without having to over sexualize yourself and overshoot it. You could have on a big baggy shirt and some baggy jeans and come up and rock it and not have to worry about who's looking at what and how it's how it's happening. But conversely, there wasn't a, a, a niche market for women in hip hop. There wasn't like, oh, we're gonna sell you these shoes. We're gonna sell you this outfit. We're gonna sell you this purse. It was like you know, kind of just jump in where you get in where you fit in, which is. Where a lot of that, that, that really masculine hip hop, that rap style, that, that boss kind of sound, that throwy kind of hip hop, mm -hmm. like that, that projection came from. So it's like, I can hold my own with these guys. You know what I mean? I can come up here and I can be a part of this. So you really had to like find your niche or find what it is that attracted you to hip hop and, and, and just attach to it. There was no marketing. For, I didn't see any marketing. For me, and I was okay with it. You know? yeah. Go ahead. I will say this. And this is, you know, just my opinion. Sure. It's it's like on one hand, you got the dope, fine, beautiful woman that's an MC or loves or hip hop, rap, or whatever. And at the same time, if she came the next day with a with I'll go with you, a trial called quest shirt on right. and not necessarily big and not necessarily fitting, mm -hmm. but rocking it, right. she will be just as fine. Right. 
the, the same day. You right. know, it wasn't a difference. It was about, like you say, embracing the culture, the culture of right. hip hop. She could come just like that to the spot tonight and be riding and be like, oh, I saw her. And she come tomorrow and got on a Run DMC shirt. And you'd be like, damn. I'm still sleeping. <laughs> but to her point, when most of the shirts or, or, or paraphernalia or whatever was coming out, it was just, it would be Run DMC shirts, the trial car quest shirts. It was never, it was never a plethora of a Queen Latifah shirt or an MC Light shirt. Like right. she said, it did go mainly towards the male. The male consumer. Yeah. Okay. You want to speak to that as a, as, as a proprietor of a business? Well, um, there were lines like Triple Five Soul and uh, P and B that tried to um, do things for women, but it's always been a, a minimal thing. And um, a lot of uh, females would wear the small versions of the male uh, attire, you know, when they were into the hip hop culture, and they enjoyed it. And and you know, they used the bandanas and put a little twist on it to uh, give it its femininity. Femininity. Yeah. Um, but um, I was just thinking about all the kind of words that were said about spectacles because uh, you're so close to it, you kind of just take it for granted, you know. Um, but it was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a time where there was a lot of uh, black consciousness. Um, everything goes in cycle, and that whole um, Malcolm X uh, period. It gave people um, a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, all the things that Spike Lee did um, with making black films. Um, so it, it was just a, a natural thing to do in a in a city like Detroit, which is like a, a chocolate city. It it was only natural to uh, follow the uh, the messages that were coming from groups in hip hop, like a Tribe Called Quest or De La Soul, or um, I'm thinking of Black Thought. What's the name of their group? Roots. The Roots. The Roots. Roots. Um, and then you had your gangster rap, you had your biggies and your Tupacs, and uh, at that point, it was just, you know, where could you go? I mean, just to, to the top. I remember meeting you when you were with Tommy Boy. And uh, at, at that time, you know, things were just really, really happening for black people in the city, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the sky was the limit, you know. You had people like uh, Maurice Malone that um, was doing things at Stanley's, uh, yeah. the Rhythm Kitchen, uh, Proof, who was very instrumental in, uh, you know, just bringing yeah. everything just like an ambassador of goodwill around the city, you know, uh, and bringing so much honesty and uh, beauty to the hip hop scene, you know, so it's, it's been my pleasure to be associated.